three. Calls me your questions, too. Bob, welcome. Nice to have you. Okay, the Midnights. How old is this band? How long have you been going on, and what do you do? About five years, and it's, I guess, uh, best described as hard, hard rock and rhythm and jazz. Mm hmm Jazz uh, has, has not been a, a terribly noticeable feature of the dead. What prompted you to get into that with the, with the uh, Midnight Band? Well, the Grateful Dead play improvisational music, mm -hmm. which is, you know, kind of the, the area that jazz is in. And hardly anybody does that anymore, so um, I guess we're kind of close, as close to a, a jazz band as, as to being a rock and roll band. I mean, we play rock and roll as well. Yeah. Do you, do you find it difficult to wear both those hats? I know you're, you know, you're still doing, you're doing the Midnights and then you're also doing the, gr uh, the Dead. Do you, ha do you have to figure out your way between these two forms as you go back and forth between the bands? The forms are not that dissimilar, but the, the scheduling and, and all that kind of maneuvering is, is a, a bit touchy. Mm -hmm. Why do you do it? I mean, what's, what's the push that makes you want to uh, uh, get want out to. there? Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. certainly. I mean, is there something you don't get from the dead that you do get from the midnight that uh, makes yeah. you want to? Yeah. I, I, I would be loath to try to describe that because it's it's different. It's a different kind of chemistry. And so when you're when I'm working with the with the midnights, it's it's most different from working with the Grateful Dead. But still, we work we work loose both mm -hmm. bands. Mm -hmm. Does, does any of it carry over? I mean, do you take back to the dead yeah. what you've learned in the Midnights and vice versa? Certainly. Yeah. Um, I brought to the Midnights a lot, a lot of what I, what I learned growing up with the Grateful Dead. And I bring back to the Grateful Dead a lot of things that I learned that I can do with the Midnights. Mm -hmm. Growing up, a uh, phrase you just used, with the Grateful Dead, uh, do you, I presume that took, what is it, 19 years now? Almost 20 years that the dead's been formed? Was it 65, I think? Uh, 18, 19 years, yeah. I think. That's about uh, longer with them than you were old before you started with them. More than half your life you spent with them. Well, is, it, well over half my life, yeah. How, in, this is an industry, of course, which is known for really short careers, meteori meteoric rises and falls. Uh, what, what makes a band survive like that? Well, for us, I guess just keeping ourselves interested in, in making the music vital and in, in so doing, keeping it vital and interesting for our fans. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a band which is, um, it sells a you know, steady amount of records, quarter million every time you put out a new album, something like that, but uh, never, never had a top ten single as far as I know. No, no, we had, we had, a, we had a couple. About a while back. Yeah, but um, the uh, but you rely more. The point is on the concert uh, uh, thing, the personal appearance you've yeah. seen than the recordings. What what made you decide to go that route in the beginning? It's what we do best. We play, we play a lot of two people, and and it's 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 an interaction. It's it, it to be able to play and see someone's fa face light up in front of you. Um, because of what you've just done, uh -huh. uh, you can easily understand how that could, could sort of uh, feed the fire. Right. Let's take a short break. We're going to come right back with Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead and Bobby and the Midnights right after this. Stay tuned. Your calls, too. Okay, our guest this morning is Bob Weir. Lo, a generation almost with the Grateful Dead and uh, the last uh, four or five years with uh, his own group soloing Bobby and the Midnights and still playing with the Dead. Um, we're getting ready to take some phone calls from you folks, so please give us a ring and we'll have some questions for Bob about uh, the bands and the music. And in the meantime, I understand we have a little clip of uh, trucking. You sing lead on that, don't you, Bob? Okay, let's see it.
Trucking, Bob Weir and uh, the Grateful Dead. We saw uh, Jerry Garcia there. He's a, uh, how would you describe him? He's a very eclectic sort of uh, person, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Well, he's, uh, he's brilliant. He's a musician from inside to out, top to bottom. He's dripping with music. Mm -hmm. He's a music junkie. Well, it, there, there was a lot of talk uh, uh, always in the in uh, days gone by about the, the dead being a family, uh, a, t a tribal experience. True or false? Kind of true. Can you explain? We fell together as uh, sort of kindred souls, I guess. And through the years, we've evolved into something of a family. I mean, I consider the people in the, in, in the Grateful Dead more my brothers than my friends. After all these years? Yeah, and they're my friends, too. It, but, it, I mean, they're, they're my brothers. It grows on you? Yeah. In other words, was it always that way, right from the, from the start? Uh, looking back, I'd have to say, yeah. It, it kind of felt that way from the, from the start, but we didn't really realize it until we got into it a few years. Okay, we have a caller from uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Princeton, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. And your question for Bob? Uh, I want to ask uh, you, Bobby, uh, what was the effect um, of on you and the band of the death of Pigpen? Well, we knew it was coming for a while. Um, we did. It, w it was sort of sudden when it happened, but we knew that he was uh, he had terminal illness and he was on his way out. Tell about Pigpen. Uh, he was Pigpen was our, our keyboard player originally. He played organ and and. Uh, and sang and played harmonica. And he was a blues man. His, his daddy was the first, the first R&B DJ in the, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so Pigpen was real well versed in rhythm and blues and blues in general. And he was more or less the, uh, the showman of our band. Um, he would always close the show for us. And and uh, and sang old rhythm and blues hits and mm. and new tunes that we would come up with that were like that. And he drank himself to death. Mm. And the effect on the band was, as the caller asked. Well, we replaced him. Um, we were sorry to see him go, but you know you have to let someone go when they when their time comes. Mm. We have a caller from uh, Washington, D.C. now with a question. Washington? Yes, Bob. I've seen a lot of shows over the years, and I was wondering, what's the, uh, the most meaningful experience that you yourself have gotten from uh, being in the band and doing so many concerts over the years? <laughs> well, I guess learning how to roll with the punches, you know? Um, we, like I say, we play improvisational music, intuitive music, and and... And it comes in waves, and sometimes it's there, and sometimes it's not. And you can't make it happen, and you can't not make it happen. But you can learn to sort of fill in the holes, and and when when the wave when the wave finally hits, you you can learn to catch it and ride it just right. If I can make a sort of analogy to surfing, um, I guess that's how best I can describe what I've learned over the years: how to deal with how to deal with music, and also how to deal with with a crowd and 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 uh, let them let them bounce back and forth be between us and the music. There are three entities involved in in uh, in playing. There's the, the there's the band, there's the audience, and the interaction. And and learning how to play with all those and how to orchestrate and arrange mm -hmm. and uh, and improvise with all that well when when you're the grateful dead do you ever really have a a non-enthusiastic crowd or some some crowds that you don't have that kind of uh, magic with oh sometimes when we tour in foreign countries and places like that we have to win people over um in this country it's not so much a problem but we generally end up establishing a rapport. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a caller from uh, White Plains, New York, Westchester County. Come in, White Plains. Yeah, good evening, Bob. Um, I'm curious, if, do you know what Tom Constantin, uh, TC, is up to? He had played keyboards about the same time as Pickpen played keyboards with the Grateful Dead. And also, I want to know if I Want to Live in America is really destined to be a number one single. I don't know if I Want to Live in America is destined to be a, num a number one single. Um, We'll see. <laughs> Personally, I, I could care less. 
Um, the commercial success is not is not really what I'm in it for. Tom Constantin is uh, is currently and has been all along writing. Uh, I guess what we would call modern classical music, avant-garde classical music, um, both electronic and uh, and and um, how, how how would you say normally instrument instrumentated acoustic keyboard acoustic. Yeah. Well, he he also does uh, um, a lot. Of, as a matter of fact, he also does a lot of keyboard work himself. He's a he's a fabulous a fabulous keyboard player. The pianist. Mm -hmm. Okay, time to take another short break. Why don't we do that right now? Our guest this morning, Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead and late of Bobby and the Midnights. Your calls too. You stay tuned, please, and give us a ring. The worst stock market crisis. Please don't be put off by all that highly uh, technical stuff we saw on that slide just then. But um, uh, Grateful Dead and uh, Bobby and the uh, Midnights and a long time at both playing uh, rhythm guitar and doing lead vocals for the Dead, at least. We're taking your phone calls this morning, and we've got a couple lined up here. We have a caller from New York City. New York City on the line? Yep. Hi, Bob. This is Curtis. Um, I was just wondering, on your last tour, you guys played a lot of older classic material, and we were wondering if there was any reason why you chose to break it all out at one time, and why now? Or come again w one more time? Um, the last Grateful Dead tour had a lot of the older classic songs, Midnight Hour and Dark Star and Love Light and all that, and we were wondering if there was any particular thing that prompted the sudden breakout. Uh, boredom. I mean, we haven't written any... We haven't finished the new songs that we're writing. And also, it seemed like high time we, we broke out some of the older tunes. You, you talked a bit about uh, uh, being a sort of a, an improvisational group that you get ideas as you go along. Uh, when you come down to writing a song, uh, trucking, for example, does that come out of other music, or do you, somebody get an idea and you say, let's work this up and try it and see what happens? Both. It, it, the way we write is... is any way it happens. Sometimes, sometimes uh, a melody and a and a, and a line, uh, a lyric, and all that will happen all at once. Sometimes we'll be doing a sound check or something, or just jamming, and uh, and a, a musical fragment will happen that will develop into a song that will overlay w lyrics over. Sometimes a lyric will come up, and we'll find music to fit it. Any, 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 any which way. Mm -hmm. Let's go down south and take a call from Mobile, Alabama. Sure. Mobile. Bobby, I'm a DJ at an album rock station here in Mobile, and the question my, li my listeners keep asking me is, when are the dead coming out with another album, or the, when are they going to do a southern tour? Soon come, man. Um, we're, I guess, about a third of the way through a uh, new album, and we had a southern tour scheduled, but... I think it's been blown off because I think it wasn't it wasn't arranged long enough in front to uh, to do it properly to properly prepare for it. But we'll be back down there. How do you work it out, Bob, uh, between the two bands, uh, the scheduling, and so far as the tours and the bookings are concerned? How are you? How do you manage to get straight on all that? Uh, well, you have to be fast on your feet. Um, and sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I, I really feel like a rock and roll rag doll, you know, being uh, stretched between two bands. But it's worth it all because uh, because both bands are so different, and and uh, what I get from from being with both bands amounts to so much for me that I wouldn't have it any other way. Hmm. Is uh, uh, the, where the beat meets the street is the uh, Midnight's new record, uh, newest record. Right. Um, is that uh, when, when you cut a record like that with a group which does not have the name value of the Grateful Dead, do you have high expectations for it as high as you would for a Dead album? Um, 
No. Uh, I just go into the studio and make the best music I can and hope that it will be, uh, will be accepted. And if it's not broadly accepted, I don't care. Be because, because as long as I'm pleased and as long as uh, it keeps me alive, you know, provides me with a living, uh, what more could I ask for? Not much. Peace of mind, I guess. That's yeah. about it. Right. Springfield, Virginia. Springfield. Hello. Hello. How yeah. you doing tonight? Okay. I enjoyed the show, Bob. I'd like to ask you, um, during your career, if you ever met or jammed with any of the Beatles, considering I've heard, you know, Beatle tunes done in your music recently. No, I've never met any of them. Um, they've been my favorite band for ever since forever, but no, I've never met any of them. Does that uh, displease you? Do you feel your life has uh, not been fulfilled? Well, no, because because they they have uh, a great multitude of of wondrous works that they've they've performed, and uh, they've been inspirational to me. And meeting them personally is, uh, you know, I don't want their autographs. I don't want their, uh, you know, I don't want to shake their hands or bother bother you know lay, be laden with them with. Uh, uh, my gratitude for all their uh, their great work or anything like that. They've done plenty. Mm. I've always been curious about the uh, the band symbol is an eyeball with wings. Where did no, you get no, the... no, no. No? Actually, the... The uh, flying eye? The great flying eye? Oh, the flying eye is one of them, but the uh, the one that... Uh, the one... There's a, a skull with a, a lightning yeah. bolt going through it. Um, and that's always pretty much been our uh, our logo for a long time. Well, now, both of those things, well, yeah. how, do they, how do they come about? How do you get something like that? Um, an artist will come up with something because he feels, he feels moved to do it, and, you know, he may have a vision or something like that and, and, and come up with something and say, how's this? And everybody will say, oh, that's no good, or, hey, look at this. That's exactly how I feel about it. How do you feel about it? And, and if, uh, if we come to a thunderous accord, which in the in the case of a few of them, we'll adopt them as uh, as as uh, logos or insignias or mm -hmm. whatever you call them. As far as uh, symbols are concerned, in the in the really early days, in the uh, in the late part of the '60s, uh, the band, the Dead, was kind of a symbol for revolution. Uh, is it does it still feel that way when you go out to play, or is that uh, revolution long in the past? Well, I. I still feel as though we're bucking the current. I mean, things aren't going exactly uh, as I would have them, though really I'm sort of, uh, well, speaking for everyone in the Grateful Dead, at least, we're all card-carrying anarchists. Really? Uh, and, uh, uh, let me see your card, please. I <laughs> know <laughs> uh, you, you couldn't, you, we couldn't do that on the air. But um, we're, we're all card-carrying anarchists, and. And, uh, oh, I don't know, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think we'll ever be less than, uh, less than somewhat displeased with the, the flow of events. We're, you know, we're into change. Change is a constant, change is a given. And learning to accept and deal with and, uh, and, and, and sort of further the cause of change is uh, is what we're all about, at least musically. And I guess that carries over philosophically as well. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one more call before we take a quick break here? Who we have? Okay, Philadelphia. Quickly, please. Oh, hello, Bob. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, this is ironic that you're speaking of revolution, because I wanted to talk about the early days and how you broke into national touring. You know, and just the, the idea of dealing with the establishment to get bread, just to survive as I, an artist. You know, how, that, how those exchanges, that compromise was made without selling out your integrity or the quote-unquote revolution. We're going to have to uh, hold on to that question until after we take our break, Bob. We're going to come back and talk about that a little more. So okay. you stay with us. Bob, we're the Grateful Dead. He'll be back and so will we. Stay tuned, please. Good morning.
morning to you. This is the CBS News Night Watch. I'm Chris Glenn, sitting in this week for Charlie Rose. For those of you just joining us, we're talking today about music with a member of one of rock and roll's most enduring groups, the Grateful Dead. He is Bob Weir, and if you've got a question or comment for him, please give us a call. Later on, we'll see why patriotism appears to be back in vogue, and then we'll get to the issue of animal rights, a debate centered on medical research experiments. First of all, let's check the morning's top news stories, and for that, here's Locke McCarthy. And this week for Charlie Rose, and more of your calls for today's music man, Bob Weir. All right, Bob Weir, the Grateful Dead, is here with us. We have a, a question hanging over from uh, just before... Uh, Lark and the news about uh, uh, national touring. How do you break into that? Well, how did we break into that, and how did we, uh, how did we uh, uh, reconcile ourselves with uh, with the co commercial aspect of um, of selling our, our music and all that kind of stuff? And really, we don't. We never did disagree with the the uh the capitalist system or anything like that i mean we're not commies or anything like that though we lived communistically by necessity for for a while all in one house um and off of what all of us could get could garner together mm -hmm. but never has passed any particular uh ism and i don't believe ever will uh When we first when we first started touring, we were we were pleased to be able to make music for for people and to to make a living doing it. And a consideration of ours has always been that that uh, record prices and ticket prices should be kept down as much as they could be kept down. We've not always been successful in in and and lots of free concerts too. We, we used to do lots yeah. of free concerts, but. but that can't be done uh, so much anymore. A very, uh, a very bad uh, uh, phrase of opprobrium back then was selling out uh, by by queuing to the to the system as you've described. Did you ever consider that you had done that? That it oh, ever bothered you? Oh, we tried you? selling out. And no one was buying. Nobody would buy. I mean, um, we 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 couldn't uh, we couldn't come up with a, an en vogue sound if we tried to if we tried to, and <laughs> we did. Okay. I mean, it never worked. All right. So we have a, we have a, a caller from Florida, and I'm sorry I did not get the name of the city exactly. Florida? Florida, Florida. All right. Hey, good evening, Bob. Hi. I caught your concert down here in 82, and it was uh, great. Uh, my question is, do you feel that you encourage the advancement of the drug culture, and if yes, do you have any regrets? Well, the drug culture is, uh, is maybe only half of a... Uh, of, uh, of a social movement, maybe not even that, maybe not even that much. The social movement being being changed, being uh, trying to trying to adapt to a new overview of uh, of how how we're going to be able to survive as uh, as a society in a in a new age, and that new age is fast upon us. And I don't think drugs are going to be able to help us much. I think education, I, and I, I hate to sound so prissy, but I think education and, and, um, and, and just awareness, just keeping one's eyes open or, and ears open, are going to be much more uh, effective in, in, in keeping oneself abreast to the changes in, in, uh, in society because it's, it's really going to change. All right, let's I take a... I think it's obvious. Let's take another short break, Bob. We're going to be back with our guest, Bob Weir, in just a moment, so you please stay with us. It all with DPH, a sleep aid for the 80s. And we have as our guest this morning, Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead and Bobby in the Midnights, and we're taking your phone calls, too. We have one on the line from Mercerville, New Jersey. Mercerville. Howdy, Bobby. How you doing? Take care of yourself. All right. I, I wanted to know what was the reason for uh, Don and Keith leaving the band. Well, Keith left the band because he died, and Donna left the band because she sort of came with Keith, and and really, the Grateful Dead, in its uh, inception, 
I don't know how to say this without sounding sexist or anything like that because I re really don't feel that way, but it's in its in inception. The idea, the basic sound was a, a, a male vocal blend. And Donna wasn't added to the band until fully a year after Keith was. She was his wife. And he was replacing Pigpen as Pigpen was busy checking out. And slowly uh, we became aware of the fact that she was a really good singer and she'd done a, a lot of really good singing and still does to, to my knowledge. But the Grateful Dead really never felt quite uh, gelled with, uh, with, uh, huh. with a, you know, a mixed, the a mixed male, vocal female blend. voices. Yeah, yeah. So, it just never suited the uh, band as a whole, I guess. And, and beyond that, beyond that, she, uh, she, she grew up singing a style. She grew up singing a, a sort of a southern gospel style. Yeah. Where she do long, slow scoops up to a note. Where, whereas uh, we. The Grateful Dead, growing up all in the same area, um, we're, we're, we're pretty much grown up with uh, a vocal style where we would do much quicker scoops mm -hmm. up to a note, so mm -hmm. she would oftentimes sound flat to us. Uh, let's uh, try to squeeze in a couple of more calls here, Bob. We have uh, Brunswick, Maine on the line, down east. Brunswick. Hello? Brunswick? Brunswick? Not there, I guess. How about, uh, let's see, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Bethlehem, are you with us? Yeah, Bob, it's good to talk to you tonight. <laughs> Firstly, I, I have to say, I love what you guys do. Keep on touring. Every concert is, is really special and, and a memory. And um, your music in particular, like no other band, helped broaden my own musical, musical awareness, and thanks for that. And given the broad musical styles that the dead use throughout all their music, I'd like to know, you know, your personal musical favorites or influences in particular that you might have. Not too much time, Bob. Okay, I like, I like anything that's well done. Um, I don't listen a whole lot to modern popular music. Because um, by and large, if you listen to a little bit of modern popular music, you've heard enough. Hmm. Uh, I like to listen to ethnic music from different, re different places on earth. I like jazz. I like classical music. I like modern classical music. Um, you should listen to the way it comes out uh, in the Grateful Dead and Bobby and the Midnight albums. I, I think you'd get the get the history of it right there. I want it all. I want I want music from around the world. I want I want I want right. to hear it and, and feel it and try to parlay some of it back. Okay. Bob Weir, our guest this morning, member of the Grateful Dead, low these many years, and now with Bobby and the Midnights and uh, having a very successful career with him for himself. And thanks so much for being with us. Great pleasure, Bob. My pleasure. Thank okay. you. Okay. Nice of you to come by.